So it's uh, 11 o'clock, and so we should start for our hour on the global economy. Um, the highlight, of course, in my view, of Davos every year, um, and uh, a, uh, um, at, at an extraordinarily interesting time. We have a very distinguished panel um, here, and I think very much um, the right people um, though, as you will notice, very much a focus on the advanced economies, but not entirely, since the IMF speaks for the world. So, to my um, left is uh, Christine Lagarde, who, of course, uh, is uh, the managing director of the IMF. Uh, to her left is Haruhiko Kuroda, um, uh, who is uh, the governor of the Bank of Japan. Um, to his left is Philip Hammond, who is the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the UK. Um, to his left is uh, Larry Fink, um, head of uh, BlackRock, of course, uh, founder, uh, and um, our one representative, but quite a powerful one of the private sector. And finally, to his left is Wolfgang Schäuble, the finance minister of Germany, um, and certainly not somebody about whom I need to introduce to this audience, um, given his prominent role for so very long. We are, I think, every year is different, um, and this year is particularly fascinating. Um, we seem to be an era of which um, uh, the IMF is actually, and I'm sure Christine Lagarde will talk about this very soon, really moderately optimistic. The world economy is improving, expected to continue to improve. Pretty well every area of the world economy is growing. Um, uh, markets are optimistic, um, but uh, the, the dominant concerns are clearly and fascinatingly and significantly political. I think it's very appropriate that we are holding this uh, panel at the day at which the new president is inaugurated. Um, we are in a world in which we expect not inconsiderable policy divergence in monetary policy between the US and other developed countries, which has implications, important implications for currencies and for financial markets. And there is obviously very real concern about the possibility of uh, trade policy friction, protectionism, um, and uh, uh, that was obviously an issue very much uh, raised by um, um, President Xi Jinping's remarkable intervention earlier this week. And then there's, of course, the little local matter um, uh, in Europe of the decision of my country, whether rightly or wrongly, in my view on that is fairly well known, um, to decide to leave the European Union. Um, so political matters are of immense significance and raise obviously very substantial tail risks. But in any way, let me start with you, uh, Christine Lagarde. How do you see the world economy from the IMS point of view and what are the things that really concern you? I think, Martin, you, your description of the situation is fairly accurate, and I would agree with most of what you said. Um, in terms of numbers, uh, we are seeing, for the first time, numbers that are not being revised down by the IMF. So that's a good sign. The second good sign is that we're seeing progress uh, from a 3.1% growth in 2016 to a forecast of 3.4% in 2017 and 3.6% of 2018. Of course, as I was reminded yesterday, this is all based on models. Uh, but this certainly is looking better than what, uh, what we have seen in previous years. Why is this? Because we are uh, seeing advanced economies doing a bit better than we had anticipated, uh, partic Japan being one, certainly. Uh, the euro area doing a bit better as well and certainly being in a, in a recovery cycle. But we're seeing, and we have actually, uh, revised up uh, our US forecast uh, because of the high probability of a stimulus package that will most likely take the form of a tax reform 
uh, more likely to happen in 2017 that the actual implementation or launching of infrastructure projects, which are not uh, either defined nor uh, actually financed, and will you know, have major hurdles as most infrastructure projects do uh, meet when, when they are uh, launched. So we have revised up the US. The question we, we have, and which is not entirely clear, is how this fiscal stimulus is going or not to be combined with trade measures that would most likely have a negative impact and the combination of the fiscal and trade measures, if they were to be taken, uh, would be uh, something to be explored and probably something that would be overall uh, not a net positive. Uh, for the moment, what we are also uh, forecasting, and this was anticipated by the markets, question, are they right or not? Uh, maybe Larry can address that one. Uh, but what was anticipated by the markets is uh, higher interest rates as a result of higher inflation and a US economy uh, working at full regime, uh, and therefore higher um, valuation of the dollar relative to other currencies, which has clearly an impact on those corporates and those sovereigns uh, that have borrowed in uh, US denominated loans and which will suffer as a result of that. So that's the landscape as we, as we see it, with uh, an upside in the short term, spillover and potentially negative spillover consequences for uh, other countries, and a big question mark as to what the policy shift will be going forward. We have slightly revised down the emerging and developing uh, markets for idiosyncratic reasons in the main, uh, India being one because of the banknotes withdrawal uh, mechanism that will probably have an impact and a negative one in 2017. Uh, Mexico, clearly as anticipated by the markets with direct potential spillover effects from the US policies. And uh, I could go on and on, but I see that you're getting impatient, so I'll stop. Okay. I promise you will, you will have the opportunity to elaborate further. Thank you very much for being so disciplined. As always, a wonderful model for everybody else. Uh, um, I'm going to turn now to Europe um, and to Mr. Schäuble, if I may. Uh, I'd be very interested in your perspective on the German and Eurozone economies. We, this is, I think, not quite the first, but there's a growing sense of confidence in the Eurozone, it's growing, most economies are growing. Um, uh, the, so the first question I would have for you is, do you feel confident about the solidity of the Eurozone uh, economy or do you actually feel it's all a sugar high from monetary policy? And secondly, maybe you'd like to comment on how far, just very briefly, before we go into it further, you think the Brexit decision might affect the Eurozone and European economies, before we discuss the details of the, that, that process. I am a little bit uncertain what will happen in this year, 2017, in the Eurozone. It's right. Actually, the Eurozone is doing economically, fiscally a little bit better. It's fine. Germany is doing rather well. We had a growth rate last year by 1.9 percent. That's not so, not so bad for, for Germany. And uh, But we have elections in some uh, uh, important European uh, member states, beginning in Netherlands in March, and some others are following. Therefore, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty. We don't really know what will be the, um, what will be the geopolitical risk on uh, if we will have problems in, in, in trade, in free trade. The German economy will, uh, uh, will feel some uh, influence on this. It's quite, quite clear. Nevertheless, we, our, our growth has been driven by, by internal demand. Our consumer demand is very high. Our, our uh, labor participation is the highest we ever used in, in history. Uh, therefore, the consumer demand is the highest we ever, we ever used. Therefore, we have some resilience, whatever will happen, but there are a lot of uncertainties. And therefore, uh, it's fine that uh, the IMF had not to review downside his forecast for last year. I will hope that it will stay for the forecast for 2017 as well, but we will see what happens. I'm not quite sure because the geopolitical risks have increased and not, they have not been uh, reduced. And in that context... I think I, 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 the, the Brexit will not have in this year. In the future, of course. In, in this year, 
I don't think that there will be a lot of uh, negative influence on the Eurozone. I don't, I don't think, and actually, you, you can see, but Phil Hammond is uh, much better. It has a positive impact on the British economy. Therefore, everything is fine until now. <laughs> well, that's obviously, um, we'll come back to these issues, but uh, that's a lead in for you, um, uh, Philip Hammond. Uh, so the British economy is fine. Brexit did no damage at all. The currency has adjusted smoothly. It's adjusting smoothly every day, making me feel poorer and poorer, but that's neither here nor there. That's part of the process. Um, and we now have a plan, and it's all going to work. Except for Tuesday, when it made you feel richer. Yes, um, a small blip in the downward trend. So, okay, so explain well, why everything well, is fully under control. First of all, let me defend um, floating exchange rates and uh, independent currencies. <laughs> this is a smooth and efficient transmission uh, mechanism that deals very effectively with an external shock, and that's what we've seen. Um, the UK economy has been resilient in 2016, confounding um, uh, many uh, skeptics who believed that we would uh, face an immediate and negative uh, response in the economy to the Brexit referendum. In fact, uh, we end uh, 2016 as the fastest growing uh, of the um, large uh, developed economies. Um, much of that has depended on uh, consumer uh, demand, consumer demand remaining very strong. Uh, and as I've said, the currency depreciation is now feeding through into uh, inflation, which will increasingly affect consumer behavior during this year. Uh, hence the lower forecast uh, for uh, economic growth in uh, 2017 as that inflation effect takes place. I think it's important that we understand what, was, what were the drivers of the uh, Brexit decision. It is simply not correct to assess um, the, the UK referendum as being uh, one and the same as the movement that led to the election of President Trump uh, in the US. There was no anti-trade rhetoric, no anti-globalization rhetoric in the UK referendum campaign. Indeed, one of the central um, tenets of the Leave campaign was that we should do more trade uh, with the rest of the world, that Britain would be free to negotiate uh, trade agreements beyond Europe. So it was, it was absolutely the opposite of the anti-trade rhetoric that we heard in the United States. But what there was, uh, clearly, was a strong strand of um, feeling against uncontrolled migration. And I lay the responsibility for that um, squarely at the door of uh, Prime Minister Blair, who failed uh, to impose transitional regime in the UK in 2004, uh, so that while other countries in Europe smoothly transitioned the A8 members and the freedom of movement from A8 members, Britain took the full force uh, of, uh, of, the, of the tide in 2004, and that created a public perception uh, which we still haven't shaken uh, off to this, uh, to this day. Um, business investment, uh, of course, is a bit of a binary story. Um, uh, some businesses, quite understandably, uh, are holding off investment decisions, waiting for the fog of Brexit to clear and, and to have a much uh, a better understanding of what the future looks like. But other businesses that are not so dependent on um, access to European market, on uh, trade barriers, um, have continued to invest. We've seen big investments in the UK by Google, by Apple, by SoftBank um, since the referendum decision. We've also seen uh, big investment decisions, for example, by Japanese car manufacturers to proceed with um, investments in the UK. Uh, and as I travel around, uh, I find that in many parts of the world, the, uh, the UK is now seen uh, as, a, as a buying opportunity because of the depreciation uh, of the currency and the fact that fundamentally uh, we are still a large market with 65 million um, affluent uh, consumers. So investment that is focused on the demands of the UK economy, I think, is still proceeding. What we've tried to do this week is to give clarity to our expectations about the future. Um, we've deliberately, uh, since the referendum, tried to keep open all the options while we conclude our internal debates about the best way forward. But what we've now done is said very clearly, we recognize 
that because our political imperative says that we cannot accept freedom of movement, we must respect the political imperative of our European partners that says without freedom of movement, you cannot be a member of the single European uh, market. So we have pitched our proposal not at membership of the market, but at a comprehensive free trade agreement between uh, an independent United Kingdom outside the European Union and the European Union. Uh, and I would hope, uh, because it's very much in the interest both of the UK and the European Union, that we continue to have free trade between uh, the UK and the European Union so that the complex supply chains that have built up over 40 years can continue to operate, the complex business relationships can continue to operate. I hope that European consumers and businesses will continue to have access to the highly efficient capital and financial services um, markets in London, and that British consumers will continue to be able to buy in the eye-watering quantities that they currently do, the goods produced uh, by European Union producers, where the UK has a hundred billion pound a year trade in goods deficit with the other 27 European Union partners. We don't want to see those trade patterns disrupted. We want to see them um, able to continue. And I just want to make two uh, final points, Martin. First of all, um, that uh, we've been very clear that in this world of a comprehensive trade agreement between the UK and the European Union, the European Union is likely to remain the UK's single largest trade partner. And it is in our vital national interest that our single largest trade partner is confident, successful, stable, and growing. Uh, and therefore, we have a strong interest in seeing that the European Union uh, is a success going forward uh, and, and is confident about that success. And we also have a strong interest in ensuring that the euro as a currency is both stable uh, and successful. The final point I would make is that uh, the UK will maintain its competitiveness. It has to maintain its competitiveness. My strong preference and my Prime Minister's strong preference is that we maintain our competitiveness by maintaining, but by remaining within the European uh, economic mainstream. Uh, with access to the European markets and on a reciprocal basis access for our European neighbours to our market, uh, continuing to operate to European norms and European regulatory standards. That is our strong preference. But if we are driven out of that market, if we are denied uh, access to uh, our uh, most important market, then we will for sure reinvent ourselves and create another way of being competitive. Just as right now, uh, with a lower productivity, lower labor productivity than our European neighbors, we maintain our competitiveness by working longer hours to ensure that overall unit labor costs in the UK remain competitive. So we will uh, ensure that we maintain our competitiveness because that is our duty uh, to the electors uh, that have put us in government to maintain their standard of living uh, uh, in, in whatever way we have to. But I hope that that will be through a comprehensive uh, free trade agreement with the European Union. And that's an interesting perspective which you've already mentioned earlier, I think, uh, um, this week. Um, has raised lots of issues which might, might be, have time to come back to. Let me turn now to Japan, um, Governor Kuroda. Um, how is Abenomics going? And um, how are your, I mean, you really have been at the forefront of thrilling new moves in central banking of the type that I think one might fairly say the finance minister of Germany doesn't entirely approve. And the, uh, how's that working? Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, our top priority for macroeconomic policy continue to uh, be to overcome deflation. Since uh, Bank of Japan introduced uh, so-called quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, or QQE, nearly four years ago, Japan's economy has improved significantly. First, corporate profits have reached near record levels. Second, the unemployment rate has declined to 3%, 
which is virtually full employment. And third, the core CPI inflation rate turned positive in autumn 2013 has and has remained positive for three years. However, the 2% price stability target has yet to be achieved. There are two major issues that we need to address in Japan. First, after a decade of deflation, inflation expectations among the public are still sort of adaptive. That is, they are heavily influenced by past inflation. In fact, inflation expectations after showing signs of picking up were weighed down again by the decline in observed inflation resulting from the significant drop in oil prices from 2014 to early 2016. Second, even with record high profits and a tight labor market, firms have remained cautious about wage increases, and which is one reason why inflation has not been gathering momentum. Against this background, the Bank of Japan introduced the so-called QQE with yield curve control in September 2016. The new policy framework consists of two components. First is the inflation overshooting commitment with which the bank committed itself to continuing to expand the monetary base until actual inflation, not the outlook, exceed 2% and stays above that level in a stable manner. The second component, yield curve control, is designed to facilitate the formation of a yield curve that is most appropriate for achieving the price stability target of 2%. Next, I just would like to make a few comments on the global economy. One notable change since the second half of last year is the global pickup in manufacturing and trade, which had been sluggish for quite a while since the global financial crisis. Asian economies have been regaining momentum with the increase in demand for IT-related goods. Japan's economy has shown clear signs of recovery in exports and industrial production as well. The global economy seems to be going through a turning point. It is not a coincidence that global economic growth, commodity prices, inflation expectations, and long-term interest rates all bottomed out in the first half of last year. So in addition to this improvement in the global economy, with low interest rate under the Bank of Japan's yield curve control, as well as the planned large-scale fiscal stimulus by the government, by the way, also various uh, structural reforms, including uh, labor market reform, uh, the government has been implementing. Uh, Japan's economy, I think, will grow around 1.5%, well above its potential uh, in the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year. As Japan's firms become more proactive, taking advantage of the favorable economic and financial environment, Japan's economy is likely to head toward a sustainable growth path under the 2% price stability target. Thank you very much. So now let me turn to you, Larry Fink. Um, from the private sector perspective, you might have a beep response, but obviously what we'd be most interested in, um, what is the transformation of American policy likely to mean for America and, and for the world? Uh, from your assessment, what should we expect uh, and what should we be concerned about? How seriously we, should we be taking some of the rhetoric we've heard? Uh, particularly on trade policy, but there are other issues. I mean, this is, I think, what is your assessment? How should we read this? Well, thank you, Martin. Let me, I, I want to just come back to all the points that were made. I think what we are, we are seeing a growth in all the points of the world. And I think the growth of the UK and in the US where we're starting to see really a rise in, in um, 
in, in optimism, especially for the small businesses in America. And I do believe the Brexit vote and the Donald Trump vote had had immediate impact on so many families and individuals in the, our two respective countries that, that they had a voice, their voice has changed policy. And whether they're right or wrong, they believe the past policies were wrong for them. And we'll find out if they're right on that. But more importantly, they are encouraged. They're spending more money. Their optimism in spending more money in the future is, is very true. In the U.S., you've seen that quite evident in car sales right after the election. And you're seeing that in, in optimism in small business uh, to invest. So, um, so we're at a point in time now the optimism is, is pretty high and, and from different components of our respective societies. And I think this is something quite important. The, but the, the other thing I would also say, getting into the Trump policies, I think one of the most important components of his policies or proposed policies is um, less, um, less impact by monetary policy, more impact by proposed fiscal policy whether it's in the form of tax relief or corporations or, or, or maybe individuals, and then two, uh, the potential of finally addressing the issue around infrastructure, which in the United States we have $2 trillion of deferred maintenance. And the combination of those two policies has now, uh, and if you see it in the stock prices of many of the commodity-oriented companies, some and from steel and cement, these company stocks are up, they may have doubled in some cases since the election. So the marketplace is, is looking at some of these policies and believing these policies, and I'm not here to suggest these, uh, the market is correct at the moment, but I think it's important to note that's where we are today. Uh, obviously, we'll find out if the, if the market is correct uh, by the ability to enact these policies and, importantly, how to pay for these policies. Um, I know as much as you do about how this will all be implemented. Uh, in our conversations with the uh, proposed economic teams, they want to be loud, noisy, and strong in the first 100 days. I think that will continue to create some optimism. On the other hand, we still have quite a bit of uncertainty about how we're, we are going to pay for this. Uh, you su suggested some of the rhetoric related to a trade adjustment tax. Um, I hope that is not the policy. I think that policy attacks the voters who voted for him. It, if you think about the, the percentage of products that are imported at the low-end retailers, it's dominated by 80 to 90 percent imports. And, um, and it served a big purpose. I mean, one of the foundations of America has been consumerism since World War II. And if any type of policy like that is changing our direction, and it's going to have some very big implications, and I'm not prepared to understand what, where they'll take, but it's a huge change for our economy, and it would be a huge change for every economy sitting here. Uh, so we need, we need to find a way how we're going to pay for that. Maybe it's a VAT tax, which is still a highly regressive tax for the families who are, uh, who are you know, buying the everyday items. Maybe they would not, I'm sure they would not put that within food and some of the real essentials. So we'll see how this is all implemented. Um, I also need to say, though, one of the other issues that we're going to be facing, all our economies here are going to be facing, is one of the great reasons of the fear of the future is the aging of our societies with an inadequacy retirement uh, plans. And we are, we, we are not talking enough about the corrosive impact on low and negative interest rates for these six and seven years, how it has really harmed that average worker, especially in a world in which we moved away from defined benefits to defined contribution. We have 
we have forced the individuals in so many countries to have that responsibility for their future. And quite frankly, in most cases, they've done a poor job. And as a result, I do believe the fear of the future is not just about the quality of the job, whether they're listened to or not, and I think they believe they've been listened to, but I do believe it is that fear and growing fear, especially in the world of longevity, that they're going to have to be working longer. And that's where we've seen the biggest increase of jobs in America since the financial crisis for men and women who are 50. They're going to have to be working longer, which has a huge impact on, on issues related to young and youth and youth employment and youth opportunities versus the elderly. But I do believe the key component of developed, advanced developed economies is, is addressing these long-term issues because they're not long-term anymore. They're today's issues and growing. And unfortunately, monetary policy has no impact on it but a corrosive one. Um, th let me thank you very, very much. Very important issues. We'll come to some of them. One issue that Christine Lagarde raised, which I'd like to raise with you, was financial risks, particularly in emerging and developing countries, associated with a rising dollar, quite a different fiscal monetary mix, a monetary policy normalization, i.e. higher interest rates, reinforcing the stronger dollar, quite possibly. Protectionism, which he didn't mention, which might do further reinforce that. We might remember that from the early 80s. Now, you're sitting right in the middle of these flows, as it were. How worried should we be? Well, in indeed, some of the policies that are being proposed um, are policies that would further strengthen the U.S. dollar. The market's forward path on Fed behavior is two to three tightenings this year, which will obviously increase the valuation of the dollar considerably which will then impact competitiveness of the United States, which will impact jobs in manufacturing that the president-elect is trying to create. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to be a big essential uh, component of, of, of the market volatilities. And I think we, we're going to have to be prepared for this. And I do believe there's going to be a great, amount, great deal of tension between the president-elect and the Federal Reserve on these issues. Uh, but we all should be aware that we are going to live in a world right now of a stronger dollar. Now, the, depending on our, our behaviors towards our trading partners, this can have a further impact on the dollar. If we aggravate some of our large lenders, and we are still the biggest borrower of Treasury debt, and if we are going to raise our deficits and not completely offset that by other tax revenues, quite frankly, uh, the, that puts even more pressure on our dollar. And in, in fact, in those circumstances, that's a very hard thing to navigate, much harder for any central banker to, to stop that trend. Uh, we see China trying to stop the outflows, and we're sitting there having a hard time doing that. And so we could have the opposite impact, and I'm not suggesting we will, but we should be aware this is one of the many outcomes that because of our fiscal policy, um, and indeed, if the fiscal policy works, it's not going to work in the first year. It's going to work in three and four. So we're going to have oversized deficits in the first year. And as I said, depending on how our relationships with our lenders, and we have huge overseas lenders. Uh, right now, the biggest lender is Japan. The second biggest lender is China. And we need to be paying quite a bit of attention on our relationships worldwide as the biggest borrower in the world. So I want to take it that you think that preserving moderately harmonious relationships with one's principal creditors is a sensible policy tool. Well, <laughs> I've always believed you, ha you should be nice to your, to your lenders. Yes. <laughs> I've lived that life. <laughs> Unless, of course, you intend to default. Um, <laughs> 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 
none of these people <laughs> said that. Um, I want to turn to you, um, Mr. Schäuble. Uh, two questions, one very brief. Here the Americans are proposing a pretty, what seems to be a pretty massive rebalancing of, between fiscal and monetary policy, looser fiscal, somewhat tighter monetary policy. How do you view that sort of policy recommendation, which also has been coming from the IMF in the Eurozone context? That's a big issue, uh, which has been uh, going ongoing for a long time. Do you see any reason to change the approach you've taken on that? The second and more important question, when you hear Philip Hammond on Brexit, do you feel encouraged by the apparent clarity of the British objectives and the desire for a harmonious open relationship? And then how do you respond with this little twist in the tail that if we don't get what we want, you might find we become Singapore on Thames? Uh, <laughs> this is slightly... Uh, miss, um, how do you respond? I, I can't really imagine that UK, this great nation, would uh, compare itself with Singapore. Therefore, I am not uh, to be shocked uh, even with this. Is, no, no. Now, uh, I think we will, we, Phil Hammond and, and, and myself, we totally agree we have uh, to manage. Uh, this decision, which is a fact by, by, the, by the British people as a Brexit, and we have to manage it in, in the best way uh, to, to, to minimize or to avoid any damage for UK as well as for Europe. And for, for, for Europe, not only for Germany, UK remains a very important partner. So we, we, we do whatever we can. In detail, it will be much more complicated uh, than in, in uh, the opening speech, that is quite clear, but the negotiation will start, and we will work. But, but German government will, will work in this, uh, in, in this negotiation, always in the direction that we minimize uh, any risk and damage for both of us, for both of us. That is, that is our, 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 our clear position. And um, look, I will, I will I would like to wait what, what will be the, the concrete decisions in the new administration in, in, in the United States as well. We will see what will happen. I, I, I can't really imagine that we will have uh, 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 huge uh, damage for, for free trade. A world leading to a superpower cannot, cannot destroy free trade. That is, uh, and I, I'm quite optimistic that even US and the Western world as a whole will not leave the defense of free trade in the world only to Chinese leadership. We will, even, we will always pay some contribution to work for increasing things. We have always in the G20, we have always worked for bringing down obstacles for free trade. And there's a lot of things to do, and therefore I have no interest for increasing. But we will see what will happen. Therefore, uh, uh, we, what we can do in Europe is to make our economy as strong as possible. And that cannot be done. In, in, uh, I, I never commend monetary policy. And we, uh, we know all the problems of the structure of the monetary union. We, we often have discussed. It has not changed. The major problem in the, in the, in the monetary union is the gap of competitiveness in the different member states of the monetary union. And that cannot be solved in weakening the stronger one. That must be solved in the direction that the weaker economies, on whatever reasons, on whatever reasons, uh, will be strengthened. And they have to take some decisions uh, for their own to make uh, some, what we call always uh, structural reforms, whatever it means. But that must be done. It's politically terrible to, to implement, even in Germany, by the way, even in Germany. My, my problem actually in Germany, to be very frank, is the news are in fiscal policy are by far too good, and people believe. And that is always a, a, a huge danger, because you are, you are, you are tempted 
to become complacent and not to, to continue to work. Therefore, and that is what I again and again I try to convince my, my friends and fellow partners that we have to work uh, not to give the wrong incentives for the political body make, decision makers in all European member states. It's, it's easy to say, it's difficult to, to do, and sometimes you get your role, which you have already ironized in, in, in greeting me, that is fine in welcoming me, but that is what we have to do. If we will not, if then Europe must become more competitive. Europe as a whole must become more competitive. And therefore, I think this week could be an, an, like the Brexit. I have said that when I, the first reaction on, on, the, on the Brexit decision for me has been I cried. And the second reaction was it's a, it's, it's a waking up call for Europe. It's a waking up call for Europe. We have to do, we have a growing Euro skepticism all over European member states. No? And um, by the way, Philip, I, I don't agree in the regard that the globalization, the anti globalization emotions in, in public didn't play a role in the Brexit decision as well. I think Euro skepticism and some reactions, surprising reactions in electorate, even in UK and the US, have a lot to do with disruptive disruptive changes in the social, political, economic structure and, and, and structure in the, in, the, in, the, in the globalized world. Of course, in Europe, the main issue has been in the last couple of years, not only in UK, with all the respect to migration issue, refugee issue. You, you know my country has suffered huge, huge uh, discussions and discussions, and, and Europe is under, under threat, and we have to overcome. The better we do, the, the more is likely that Europe will remain a strong part of a growing economic, global economy. Just one very quick follow-up, because it's so central right now. There is quite a bit of concern that two years after the, um, the Brexit negotiations begin, that one might end up with essentially no agreements, that it becomes a cliff edge, which would be incredibly disruptive. From your perspective, clearly this is not something the British government wants. From your perspective, from the European Union side, how concerned would sh should one be that that might happen? We are very concerned that it will not happen, and we will, we will not only be concerned, we will be engaged that it will not happen, because it would be a disaster for all of us. By the way, I am personally totally convinced that even after all the, all, all the negotiations have been done, London will remain an important financial center for Europe. And, and the fin finance center of London is serving the Euro European economy. And therefore, of course, we have discussed when we discussed the, the weeks ago uh, that you can't, you can't speculate on interim solutions before you know what will be the final outcome. Now we know the final outcome. Now we can start to work and we will do, and we will do what, whatever we can to avoid such a, such a situation. I think it's, it's possible to, 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 to get it done. I have one follow-up question for Larry Fink, which we haven't discussed. One of the themes from the <clears throat> new Congress, which might be very significant here, is very significant financial sector deregulation. And so the question is, do you think that might actually reverse in some profound way, which would have global effects, the sort of post-2009 regulatory structure, which was not only an American one, but became a global one under American in uh, uh, leadership. Is this going to be a new financial world, and, in what, and if so, in what way? No. 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 That's very encouraging. Uh, um, well, we don't want to redo. I mean, this is chaos if we so undo of, everything we've done. Yeah, right. And I don't think anyone's asking for that or wishing for that. Um, I do believe there is great things we could do to create greater efficiency. Um, there may be areas where we can ease that it was overbearing, but the core, what I would say, of the of the BIS and the uh, Financial Stability Board initiatives and the FSOC initiatives, Dodd Frank, and, and are essential 
And I don't think anyone is calling for a, a total remove, uh, dismissal. And I think everybody does realize this is not one thing that could be done unilaterally because it was done on a, on a global stage. And, the, and what we did learn from the financial crisis is that we are all interconnected. And I don't think that has gone away. Everyone understands that, if anything, we're probably even more interconnected. And I would just say one other thing. Um, we've seen great advancements in other places of the world, like China, where non-bank uh, entities are taking over more and more of the banking um, initiatives in those countries. Um, we have laws that make it difficult for non-banks who really want to get into that business. Um, I think the last thing a lot of banks would like to have, that type of technological competition. Uh, so regulation actually not just only um, makes the world a safer, more, and a better interconnected uh, uh, across all regions, um, it inhibits new participants. Uh, and so regulation um, is not as bad as people think. But one of the things that I hear from more and more CEOs, if we could even keep the rules intact but just change the tone, because the tone at many times in many jurisdictions has been quite hostile. And, um, and, and, and the, the repeating of, of requests from all these different varied regulators um, has created huge costs. Um, the greatest increase in expenses by m most banks is legal compliance. Some of it has been needed. Um, and um, so it's been a great growth area, an unfortunate growth area for many of these organizations. So if we get, I do believe the tone needs to be changed, but the fundamental regulation should remain. I, because we're running out of time, I'd like to take a, about three questions, see how they go. Is, um, uh, please ask a question, make it one sentence. You don't have two questions and you don't have the opportunity to make a speech. I will be rather brutal about it. Uh, this gentleman here, please stand up, say who you are, and ask the question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kumagai, and uh, I'm a chief economist at the Daiwa Institute of Research in Japan. And uh, last year, uh, we happened to meet uh, two black swans in the UK and uh, in the United States. And my simple question is, uh, what will be the black swan or uh, tail risk uh, we might encounter this year? I didn't get the what sort of fund? <laughs> Black Swan. Black Swan. Ah, yeah. Black Swan. Okay, okay, very good question. Mm -hmm. um, they're not very black anymore, are they? <laughs> uh, gentlemen there, uh, please stand up. Yes, thank you. My name is Tony Eko from Nigeria. Oh. Economic outlook for Africa and Latin. It wasn't discussed at all. Yeah, very good. And one final question this round. Somebody over there, yeah, please stand up. Thank you. Can you get a microphone to this gentleman? Uh, hi, I'm a global shaper from Delhi. My name is Utkarsh. I work for Microsoft. My question is, in this world of artificial intelligence and disruption, do you feel that the policy is continuously lagging? And what is it that policymakers can do to redefine global economy? Okay, uh, this is on how artificial intelligence, new technologies, our policymakers operating about 30 years behind the time. I think that was more or less the sense I got of this question, yes? Um, of course they are. Uh, the, I think, Christine Lagarde, I think most of these questions are probably for you. Let's start. What are the black swans? By definition, we don't know what the black swans are. So what are the grayish ones? Uh, um, uh, the, uh, that we should be uh, concerned about. And, of course, one of the things which we haven't discussed is the outcome of some of these elections, uh, including the one in your own native country. Um, we haven't talked about Africa and Latin America really at all. That's very important. Uh, um, approximately 1.7 billion people or so. I don't know the exact number, maybe 1.6. Um, uh, could you answer on those two questions? Yeah. Um, 
On, on the black swans, I will not speculate on what the outcome of the elections will be, neither in the Netherlands, nor in Germany, nor in France. But uh, I would say that if the disruptions that we are expecting for 2017 as a result of what has happened in 2016 prove to be all negative, and we're to end up in a race to the bottom on the tax front, on the trade front, on the financial regulation front, then that, for me, would be a really big black swan, which would have devastating effects for other countries probably than those that are probably likely to cause it. And that takes me to um, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, because one of the um, matters that everybody has to deal with at the moment is the migration of people. So we talk about mobility, we talk about professional mobility, but there is the geographical mobility that is to be expected from countries where the expectations, the inequalities relative to others is significant. So you ask me the outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa. It's very diverse because Sub-Saharan Africa is not a country, it's a continent full of diversity and different set of policies. But we're moving from 1.8 in 2016 to, uh, sorry, 1.6 to 2.8 to 3.7. So again, we're seeing growth, and some of that growth is obviously generated by you know, additional trade, additional movement that there is as a result of more trade taking place in advanced economies. It's also locally generated for some countries, and it's also generated by the commodity prices, which are likely to go up, although with some volatility. But there are significant variations. We've revised up, up uh, a country like Nigeria, for instance. It's a factor of how much they will be able to uh, control security, uh, particularly in the oil fields uh, and refineries areas. Uh, we've uh, revised down other countries. But in the main, there is interconnections between those low-income countries and the emerging and advanced economies. And as I said, we see the spillover effects, particularly in relation to the dollars, uh, on those countries that are, for some of them, largely uh, indebted in US-denominated loans as significant. Um, I think those were the first yes, two. Yes, Larry, you wanted to say something. I would say, I would say clearly um, the two election results were not black swans. Markets adapted very quickly and they were fine. I would not define that as a black swan. There were certainly swan. gray swans. But, I mean, yeah, I don't I mean in the sense that I, they were it, considered it, odds against, correct, but clearly but I, possible. But black swans, to me, represent a real market disallocation, and we, we did not really see that. It was fine. We adapted uh, very rapidly and, and, and quite efficiently and, and in a very short order. Um, my biggest worry is linking the other two questions, though. I think the biggest black swan is, is the role of technology and how technology is changing um, the workforces everywhere in the world, it's impacting the developed economies more than the developing economies. And that's what the sense of this anger and fear uh, that created those two election results. But I do believe the model for emerging countries to follow what China did and having very cheap labor and good infrastructure was yesterday's business, you know, model for growth. And I think what we're seeing now across the world, and you're seeing China trying to rapidly change it, and this is what part of the 10-year the plan of President Xi is, is technology within China too, that you're using more machines and less human input. Uh, I think that's the future of Japan with its bad demographics. And I worry for the countries in the developing world that have an economy that's based on cheap labor and not education, those economies are going to fail miserably. And that is my black swan that many countries that have little history in innovation, little history in education, will be even less prepared for tomorrow than they are today, and that will be that will ultimately create more global uh, uh, divisions, maybe more migration issues, but more importantly, more income disparities that we've ever seen. I think this, this incredibly deep question is the ladder of development, which was export-led growth on the basis of cheap labor, broken, cut. If so, that is very profound. We can't solve that, unfortunately, in the next five minutes. But the question has been raised. Hariki Kuroda, did you want to comment on these yeah. questions? 
just a short comment on black swan or gray swan and so on and so forth. I would like to say that uh, there may be a white swan. Uh, because uh, the latest uh, wheel uh, made by the IMF, uh, to me, appears to be fairly uh, uh, cautious. And so that uh, there may be uh, upside risk in the US economy uh, this year and next year. Of course, on the condition that, uh, as uh, Minister Schäuble said, uh, there's no uh, protectionism spreading uh, uh, all over the world. Thank you. I wanted to, <laughs> Philip Hammond, did you want to comment at all on this new technology and so forth and how positioned are our economy for this? I want to say two things. First of all, just on the Africa point, and Christine's, it's, it's nice to hear Christine talking about slightly higher growth projections for sub Saharan Africa, for Nigeria in particular. But of course, what she didn't say was that this is nowhere near enough growth to absorb the population growth. Uh, so we're talking about um, uh, higher GDP growth, but uh, lower GDP per capita. And unless we solve that problem, then the pressure from sub-Saharan Africa will continue. Um, on disruptive technology, look, we, we've been talking a lot here and at IMF meeting in Washington in October about um, the challenge of uh, populist movements against trade and globalization, the challenge of aging, and the pressure that puts on politicians in trying to manage economies. That's before we even talk about the pressure that's gonna come from technological um, change. So it won't, I, I think even Larry would agree, it's not gonna happen in 2017. But over the next decade or two, uh, we are gonna see technology added to the challenge of demography uh, and the uh, pressure, uh, pressures on uh, trade and globalization. Um, and speaking from a UK perspective, we recognize that this is a challenge, that it, it particularly represents a challenge for people in our economy with low skills, particularly older workers uh, who don't feel able to embrace and learn uh, new skills and new technologies. But we also recognize that it, it's living in a fool's paradise to pretend that you can ignore this. Um, you have two choices. You either embrace it uh, and, and hope you can run with it, or you ignore it and definitely get crushed by it. Um, so we have to embrace it. We, we will use the proven track record of our economy to innovate, uh, to embrace, and to use technology as a driver of growth. We're, we're fortunate in, the, in a number of areas of uh, cutting edge disruptive technology by, by luck or good judgment or design or a good politics, I don't know which, uh, we happen to find that, that we have uh, hubs of you know, artificial intelligence development, but, um, advanced biotechnology happening in the UK, and we will exploit them um, to the full. And that means um, not only an environment that encourages them, but also government and uh, state regulatory bodies actively facilitating them. So the regulatory sandbox that we've created in London for fintech companies is, is more important than any fiscal stimulus we can ever give, and give them. Giving them a safe place uh, to experiment in the real world uh, with financial services technology uh, is the biggest boost we can offer. Uh, yes, please. Thanks, Martin. I, I just want to add one thing to what Phil uh, said about the per capita growth. You're absolutely right. And I would like to add that growth will not be sustainable if it is not inclusive. And inclu inclusiveness means uh, looking after helping and supporting those countries that are in development process and that still need the 0.7% that the UK has continued so far uh, to contribute to development and that all countries should adhere to and do more to help because otherwise we will be dealing with massive uh, inequality issues at all levels, which will challenge growth. Oh my God, this should be off. <laughs> Time off. Huh? It, it tells that, that's never happened before. <laughs> but it tells me actually that it, the session is closed. Uh, so um, this is how I would sum up our really fascinating discussion. The economy worldwide is improving. 
um, and might well do even better than uh, the IMF forecast. If so, I think that will be the first time for about six years, uh, because I have a wonderful chart which shows that every year the IMF downgrades its forecast for the next five years. So if this is, uh, they're about to start upgrading the forecast, this is a new world. Uh, it would indicate that the biases aren't consistent, at least. Um, and they are worldwide, though the, the, it's clear from this. Uh, gigantic challenges in the parts of the world not represented on this panel, um, and that's really very important, worth stressing. The second point is last year was a pretty big year for politics and has left some very big questions. One of them is the local one, Brexit, and certainly the participants, very distinguished participants here, wanted to give us a very strong message that Britain sort of knows what it wants and uh, Europe's most important power, at least, not the only voice by any means, but the most important single voice, I would have thought, is pretty determined that an agreement will be reached that works and keeps a harmonious relationship between Britain and the rest of the European Union. And that, if it's true, would be incredibly important and positive locally, as it were, in Europe. And I must say this week is the first week since the referendum when I began to feel one has some sense of where this might go, um, some agreement. I think we were given to understand that maybe the revolution in Washington won't be as devastating as some fear, and that uh, the structure of the world trading system, the world financial system, will remain more or less intact. Um, and all I can say is, please, God. And, the, uh, and obviously, that's incredibly important. We've given pretty strong indication that there are countries represented here will do everything in their power to encourage America, the new American administration, in that direction. This still leaves us with the huge challenge of dealing with a lot of very unhappy people in the developed world. And as Christine Lagarde and the IMF has been insisting for some time, if we don't make development inclusive, both globally and locally, we risk more of these disruptions. Um, and the frightening thing about them is the policies that might be introduced as a result of these disruptions make the position of the people who are so angry actually worse. So we get into a vicious downward spiral. And that's obviously the thing that we must most be most concerned about. But I think the, these panelists want to give you the message that things are okay, possibly improving, and with some luck, grown-ups will remain in charge. I hope they're right. Thank you very much.